Good evening, Philippines. Good morning and good afternoon to the other participants from the other parts of the world who are watching this webinar. Welcome to the IGP's 202nd free international webinar. And thank you so much for joining with us in this wonderful evening. I am Mr. Rianjun P. Kualing from Aklan, Philippines, and I will be your host for this event. I am a mathematics teacher of Batan Academy Senior High School Department in the Department of Education Division of Aklan, Philippines. I am honored and privileged to be in the IGP as a webinar host and, of course, as an active global member. It is my delight to welcome you all in this institution of Global Professionals free international webinar. I hope everyone will stay active to participate in our activities later on. And before we continue, you may uh, like and comment while our webinar is going on. Please tag, share, and mention your friends in the comment box so that we can be able to share with them the knowledge that our speakers will impart to us. In this virtual world, we can watch together and learn together. The events and activities that I provide to us are proofs that pandemic does not just bring challenges and difficulties in life, but also it offers a lot of opportunities. For the new members, let me give some backgrounds about IGP. IGP stands for Institute of Global Professionals, and it is an ISO training and education institute. It is recognized internationally and globally accredited to more than 100 countries. IGP is a leading online skill development institute with thousands of learners worldwide. IGP serves the world communities by providing holistic social work in education to help build a world with a strong foundation of education and life skills. IGP gives opportunities accessible for every knowledge seeker to gain mastery of skills, to develop personality, to become more goal-oriented, to strengthen confidence in facing inner circumstances in life, and to enhance skills by inviting great speakers and professionals from other parts of the world. The organization believes that skills development does not just gain through a formal education. So IGP offers free virtual training and consultation to young professionals who are willing to learn, improve, and embrace change. It organizes webinars, trainings, both offline and online courses with the best and highly trained speakers and coaches from all corners of the world to create a best learning platform for all of us dear participants. Before we continue, again, please share, tag, comment, and mention your friends in the comment box. It also serves as your support to our organization. Moreover, participants who will attend to this free international webinar will receive an e-certificate that they can use in the future. So today we are presenting the 202nd free international webinar series entitled Teaching English as a Foreign Language and Assessment. This is just part one out of four and we will be enlightened by our uh, two speakers coming from Indonesia who will be introduced later on as they deliver their speeches. Now it's time to start our program and uh, for our uh, first speaker, we will give the spotlight as she introduces herself to us to be followed by her lecture. Fellow learner participants, please welcome Dr. Surya Masniari Hutagalong. Hello, Dr. Hello, Mr. Surya. Jim. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, doctor. And uh, I'm glad to meet you in uh, IGP. Me too. Thank you. I would like to start, uh, Mr. Jun. Okay. 
Okay, good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you, uh, IGP, for giving me a chance to be able to join us as a speaker in this event. It's such an honor for me joining with us and share my knowledge and my experience uh, here virtually. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Surya Masnyari Hutagalung and I, and I come from Medan, North Sumatra, and I teach at the Universitas Negri Medan, uh, Medan of University. Today, I would like to explain about what I'm doing uh, in language learning and teaching, especially regarding to the learning assessment. My experience was titled case to project. Uh, moment, I would like. Okay, I want to share my uh, presentation. Before starting, I want to convey the discussion points of this presentation. Uh, the first is background. And after that, we are going to step of case to project. And the third is case to project as assignment. And then we are moving to the conclusion statement and we'll close this presentation by closing. Well, after we know the points of this discussion, we also need to know about the basic question to support the background in this issue, such as why case to project method and why was this title chosen? All right. Nowadays, in the era towards to the society uh, of 5.0, there are so many things will be made related to the quality of human research, especially lecture and graduates. Also, the quality of university related to be professionalism, cooperation and publication achieved. One of the main performance indicators is to conduct the learning which demands for the ability, namely critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. It is believed that uh, if the student has the ability of 4C, then he will be able to compete uh, that learning to compete, I mean, uh, to compete in the era of society for, for, for 5.0. So it is very important that uh, learning must be able uh, to make students have the ability to think cri critically, creatively, e able to communicate what is produced, and also able to work with team. Next slide is, uh, yes. For that reason, learning is now recommend, recommended using a case study and project-based project learning. Because both of these methods uh, are considered able to realize students who have 4C ability. Through case study, students are trained to be able to communicate and think critically. And through problem-based learning methods, students are trained to be able to be creative and collaborate. 
As we know, uh, the case study method consists of five steps, namely, uh, the first is the first is orienting the students at the problems. It means that the teacher directs the students to know the problem that presented. The second is organizing the students. It means that the teacher sets the students into a group. The third is guiding the group or individual inquires. It means that the students should find out the information from various sources to get the solution for the uh, for the problems. The four is developing and presenting the result of their works. Means that the students will arrange the report as a problem solving, and then they will present uh, the result. The fifth is analyzing and evaluating the problem solving process. Means that the students and the teacher will analyze and discuss the solutions which given and make a conclusion. Furthermore, is project best learning. In this step, there are uh, nine activities carried activities carried out uh, to produce learning product. It starts with connecting the problem to real life, then identifying the problem and def defining it appropriately so that the lens can be solved appropriately as well. After that, an investigation and brainstorm with the student to explain uh, the challenge in deep and what to do related to that challenge. Then make a plan or design to solve the problem. The teacher guides the student to understand the design so that the student is able to make a prototype and test it on the uh, on expert or teacher. At the time of testing it, uh, the expert or teacher gives input. Then the student will improve and make, a, uh, make that better. Well, also, uh, well, also the, uh, the thing which I need to explain or convey that at our university, there is an obligation, obligation of lectures to assign as many as six activities in learning on uh, and sorry and assignment and six assignment in learning in each course to the student those assignment are routine task routine task which are given in every every course uh, if every one topic, of course, and critical book review. Critical book review, the task is uh, to review books related to the course. And then critical journal report, which is reviewing, jour reviewing, reviewing journals related to the course as well. Fourth is mini research, mini research, Research, it means the students will do a simple uh, research related to the topic of subject. Engineering idea. The students should find out an idea. Project, the last task, which means the students will do a project as a learning product. Also, the six assignment must be given in each course and lecture, even though sometimes the students complain about the number of assignment because in one course they have to do six tasks. Plus the results of assignment for case study and project based learning. This is such a must for them. 
this is the background why it came up with the case to project method. In case to project method, the sixth assignment itself is made in one, not a separate, a separate assignment anymore. Then the problem-based learning and project-based learning steps are put together, became, became simple. This is the result of collaboration between case study, project-based learning, and six tasks. A brief step can be described as follows, starting with creating problem uh, to find the case teacher, uh, to find the case teacher uh, can be present pictures or videos or image or text. And then the teacher uh, determine the work group, then doing reference studies as mini research to solve problems by critical book review and critical journal review. From that, uh, from that mini research, we'll find the solution to the pre preliminary problem. But the new ideas are needed to link the problem with the result of reference by presenting the engineering idea. In order to realize the idea given to engineering idea is carried by the project. The result of, uh, of the student's work are collect, collected in writing and present uh, uh, in writing and presented in front of the class. This is where the student skills assessment is taken, writing skills and speaking skills. Well, uh, here is one example using case to project method with the theme family. In the first step, uh, the lecturer provides a picture video or text. In this example, I use a picture. Uh, then the le lecture directs the question that posed to the problems which have been concept. There are so many ways that the lecture can do direct or guide the students. For example, by provide a video, uh, for example, by provide a video card where it's taken from YouTube the video must be appropriate with the theme of family. Another way, uh, the lecturer also can provide some pictures to the students and ask them what may be on their mind while looking at the picture. Yeah. In this step, uh, the lecturer will direct the question to the case. For example, yeah, uh, here uh, a tree picture also, also for example, what the difference am, among the first, second, and third picture. In the steps, the lecture guides the students about what will they do. In this part, uh, the lecturer get to know them to inform that their work is to know about the kinds of family in Germany, uh, at teach Germany, and compare to the family in Indonesia. So the students have to get more information about that in order they are able to arrange the report there. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. Step three, uh, in the step extracting information, yeah, the next step in extracting information. Okay. In this step, the students looking for the information related to the theme, namely family. Uh, the lecturer guides the students to figure out the information within the books or journals. Even though the pictures are simple, it is hoped that the students will be able to discuss about uh, the theme. To find out the more information in this activity, 
uh, the student will do mini research by doing CBR and CGR and also other sorts such as conducting interviews or observations. Uh, the next discussion with expert <clears throat> to test the result of work. So the report that has been written need to discuss to the expert or teacher in order to correct if there are uh, if there are mistakes and make it be better. The next is uh, to find the new ideas. Surely, when there is a study reference and a discussion with the expert, there will appear another idea. Each case is required to create a new one related to the previous case. Uh, next, the students in their group will design their idea. This activity will do in the sixth activity. Yeah. Uh, design was then worked out and produced a new one. And then uh, determine the si design and basic concept. After they are working out and produce their new idea, I mean the students, they will move on the on uh, the move on the seventh step. Yeah, which is that new design must be reported especially about uh, the germination process the report is not only written but must be presented as well so uh, the written and spoken reports were taught to represent the writing and speaking ability in this step uh, step eight and step nine an assessment is carried out on writing and spoken. Uh, the reports that writing will assess by using evaluation instrument, which is rubric. And while the students present and speak, it will be evaluated by using evaluation instrument, which is evaluation rubric for, uh, for speaking competence. This is the uh, this is the example of evaluation uh, rubric which arrange there are three aspects that are assist assist in uh, written uh, uh, in learning namely written uh, spoken and attitude yeah uh, for written assessment there are two aspects that are uh, there are asset namely aspect of content assignment and language students can get a grade of four if the results are down related to the team and uh, for content assignment uh, student uh, i mean i mean uh, it means the student report uh, the assignment completely yeah uh, introduction content and conclusion yeah grade uh, grade 3 related to the theme that contains two of the introduction content uh, introduction content and conclusion it means the students report the assignment not fully completely it might be there are uh, uh, just introduction and content or uh, just uh, in uh, content and conclusion or uh, introduction uh, or the just content and conclusion yeah on uh, and grade two related to the theme that contains one of the introduction content and conclusion it means the students report the assignment of uh, not fully completely even just make one aspect like only make uh, the introduction or content or conclusion and a great one unrelated to the team means that student did the assignment but no uh, but not suitable to the team that given and then language the chosen words uh, 
uh, this rubric is the chosen words are uh, right the properly grammar and re the, re the relation between sentence and uh, appro appropriate it means that all structure all the structure uh, the words are used and grammar going great without mistake and uh, there are mistakes among the chosen words grammar and the relation between sentence but not really bad because still be able to understand it means that the students make some mistakes on working the assignment uh, those seem from the grammar structure uh, and uh, the chosen words uh, grade two there are mistakes among the chosen words grammar and relation the relation between sentence and those mistakes are really disturbing this understanding it means uh, that the students make more mistakes on working the assignment and those mistakes start to disturb start to disturb the understanding of the teacher a great one too much in making mistakes and it can uh, it can even be understood all of the grammar structure and the chosen words are super bad uh, and, and messed up. Uh, the next is uh, oral evaluation rubric. There are three aspects, uh, content presentation, language uh, means uh, chosen words and grammar and, uh, and pronunciation. Uh, grade four, the report is written completely and coherent. It means all of the content presentation is written coherent to the theme that given. And uh, grade three, there are some that are not suitable to the written report, but still make sense or coherent. It means. Uh, there is some incoherent context in the presentation, but still able to understand. Great to a lot of uh, unsuitable statement, but still makes sense. It means that too many statements are going bad, but still makes sense no, uh, to understand. Great one, not suitable to the report at all. The students did it wrong and incoherent at all. And then pronunciation. Almost same like uh, the native speaker, so easy to understand is for uh, grade four. Uh, by looking this aspect, we can conclude, we can conclude that the students good in grammar and have the ability to choose the words properly. A uh, grade three, uh, there's some words uh, there's some words which are wrong uh, its pronunciation but still be able to understand uh, it means different with the previous student in this aspect the student on um, grade two so many mistakes which make hard to understand the students might be can't speak English well. So they have a trouble uh, in pronunciation, like me, each word in English, or they might be only good in writing. And a great one can't be understood at all. Yeah, they lack of vocabulary and it makes them hard to speak, to speak up sweet to the team. And then uh, manner aspect uh, attitude attitude valuation rubric attitude valuation rubric. Well, we are going to the nine appearance. Yeah, I want to uh, explain about appearance. Mm -hmm. And then in why. Why should uh, attitude evaluation rubric and in the academic, uh, I mean in our university, 
there are some uh, govern regarding to the affairs and attitude therefore we also we also do an attitude valuation in every subject for attitude valuation we make the instrument or rubric as follows affairs uh, material delivery answering question emotionally but uh, not emotionally but with manners and empathy give sense give sense uh, to uh, give chance to others to confirm friendly and uh, an emotional avoid discrimination in statement and question uh, well we are going to the end of the content in this discussion which is conclusion after knowing the step of case to project in learning foreign language we can conclude the that case to project is an effective method or we evaluate uh, evaluate students ability in those four skills in language learning and also we can make those six assignments that given to student in each course becomes simple by implementing the case to project method or ways in learning for range language especially in uh, uh, for range language learning even though the case to project can make those six assignments become simple, but the students still ask to think critically, creatively able to communicate what is produced well and also able to work with them. So they can face those things or challenges that happen to what the uh, 5.0 so, uh, society which need a good of human resource especially lecturers and graduates also the quality of university related to the prof professionalism cooperation and publication achieved uh, this is the the closing that's all about my presentation in explain what case to project method is why it appears and how the uh, how the implementation is or how it is work. I hope this material that I have been presented will help us in teaching language, especially in its assessment and evaluation. Thank you so much for your good intention from the beginning till the end. And, with, uh, and it will be my pleasure to answer if there might be some questions. Good evening. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Surya. Before we go to the some of the details, uh, let me just uh, share to you some of the notes that I uh, have taken out of the lecture of Dr. Surya. Dr. Surya was able to differentiate to us the case study and the project-based um, Case study involves orienting, organizing the students, guiding the, to the group, and then presenting of the output. While project-based is has something to do with connecting to real life, re defining challenges, having the solutions through research and brainstorming with the students, and explaining the challenges. And of course, we have the six activities in learning. We have number one is the routine task, critical book review, critical journal report, mini research, engineering idea, and a project that is based on the university where Dr. Surya is, I think, at teaching. Okay. And also, Dr. Surya was able to uh, discuss to us the different valuation criteria in uh, giving the grades for the, the students. And... Uh, we can uh, see that based on the rubric in a project-based study, students are not just merely aiming to complete the project, but also to understand the details and communicate that understanding to others, which is very important. So we can say that project-based study can be considered as a holistic approach to develop students' performance. Okay, and because of that, thank you so much, Dr. Surya Basniyari Hutagalong.
thank you mr june thank you yes, for it was a, it was a very a marvelous presentation and uh thank you so much for giving us your valuable time this session has been a great opportunity for our audience to hear those things that you have shared once again thank you for enlightening us with your pearls of wisdom and story okay so before we continue to the second speaker again i would like to request uh, our audience to please support us by sharing tagging and mentioning your friends in the comment section later on we will have the e-certificate link in the comment box and if ever that you will face any problem we can have instructions later on on how to claim your e-certificate so moving on let's now go to our next speaker our next speaker is an english lecturer at universitas Nigeri malang his areas of interest are teaching english as a foreign language or tefl assessment grammar and computer assisted language learning or c-a-l-l he has published an article in atlantis press and a research article ranked international journal ladies and gentlemen we have dr ahmad heki sujat moko from indonesia okay hello mr chiu nice hello, to meet sir. you Okay. Nice to meet you, sir. Okay, it's amazing. And congratulations for uh, Dr. Surya. Uh, that is amazing presentation that you have done. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, uh, can I start now, Mr. June? Yes, sir. It's okay, your time. Okay, I would like to uh, ask the permission for sharing my screen first, okay? Okay, so what do you think? Can you see my screen here, Mr. June? And yes, sir. Gentlemen? Okay, so I would like to. Uh... Okay, can I start now? Yes, sir. Okay, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. How are you today? I hope that you are fine now and you are uh, still healthy and ready to join this uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the chance and opportunity given to me for doing this presentation in this amazing room, okay, <clears throat> amazing event. And today I would like to present the materials entitled Tax Based Assessments to Support the Virtual Clip EFL Classrooms. So referring to the title I have now, so at least there are four subtopics or things that I want to discuss in this presentation. The first is about uh, the assessment. The second is about the task, and uh, the third is about the uh, virtual learning activities. And the last one is about the flipped learning concept or model. Okay, well, I want to start uh, from the first subtopic or thing that I want to discuss in this presentation. It's about the assessment, yeah? Why is assessment? Why assessing? So this is a big question we have as the teachers. In this case, every time we want to conduct the teaching and learning activities, we sometimes forget to think about the assessment or the assessing activities. So when this happens, there is a big question that we need to ask to ourselves, uh, considering about the student's understanding, comprehension, and progress and development. For example, like how can we make sure that the students understand about uh, the materials that we are explaining or we have explained if we do not assess them? Then how can we make sure that the students get, uh, what is that, the, the progress and development after doing various kinds of learning activities if we do not uh, assess them? So those questions cannot be found the answers if we never assess the students. So that's why here it is quite necessary for us to uh, realize the importance of assessment, I mean, of giving assessment or doing the assessing activities activities for our students. So that's why here as the teachers, we not only try to give the explanation to the students, but we also try. Uh, this is like a, 
uh, we have the responsibility for understanding or recognizing how the students' progress can be developed or improved here by doing some assessing activities. So that's why, in other words, we can say that the teaching and learning activities cannot be separated from the assessing activities. And this condition actually uh, is in accordance, uh, this condition is actually in accordance with uh, the statement given by part here. Now you can see about uh, this uh, statement that I have quoted here and I have found in this presentation. Uh, the statement is, was, uh, was given by part in 2010. Uh, it is stated that all teachers spend a considerable proportion of their working lives assessing the students' works. So by understanding the statement given by part here, we can say that the teachers actually have big proportion, have many times to assess the students, okay? And then uh, the second thing that we can uh, take into the consideration by understanding the statement given by part here is that in doing the assessing activities, actually the assessing activities can be done in all stages uh, of the teaching and uh, learning activities conducted by the teachers. For example, uh, supposing that uh, before we want to conduct the teaching and learning activities, so we would like to prepare many things, for example, like the materials. So besides, we try, as the teachers, we try to prepare about the materials for uh, being given to the students and the teaching and learning activities that we, are, we want to conduct. So I think it's also important for us to think about the assessments. So in this case, we can select and use the assessments, the appropriate assessments, referring to the materials that we want to teach to our students to be given to the students. So that's why here, uh, before conducting the teaching and learning activities, we think about the assessment. We think about the assessing activities that can be given to our students. And then, in the middle of the teaching and learning activities conducted by the teachers, it is also possible that the teachers assess the students. For example, I want to give you the example. Uh, supposing that the teachers are explaining or giving the explanation about the materials to the students, okay? And then, uh, it is expected that when doing the explanation or giving the explanations, the teachers uh, do not uh, speak by themselves, do not talk about the uh, theories, the concept by themselves. But it is quite better if the teachers try to involve the students in uh, the presentation or in the explanations uh, conducted. In this case, the teachers may ask the students some questions. By giving the questions, so this is like uh, the teachers have the plan to assess the students. The teachers want to measure, want to know, recognize about the students' progress and developments, the students' understanding capacity, and so on. So that's why here, in the middle of the teaching and learning activities conducted by the teachers, so there is the possibility for the teachers to assess the students by giving some questions. And also what happens to the students when we ask the questions or we give some questions related to the explanations that we have. So the students may have, may give the responses, may answer the questions we have. When the students can do something like this, so we uh, we can see that there is the progress, there is the development that the students may have by answering the questions. So that's why here, the assessing activities can also be done in the middle of the teaching and uh, learning activities conducted by the teachers. And then finally, what happens at the end of the teaching and learning activities conducted by the teachers, we often see that many teachers uh, try to give the assignments or try to give the tasks to the students after uh, the teaching and learning activities conducted or are over in this case. So it's quite necessary because the teachers want to make sure that uh, the learning or the teaching activities conducted uh, have, has been successful for the teach, uh, for the students. In this case, the students are expected to understand, to comprehend about the materials given or taught. So that's why here it is quite necessary for the teachers to measure by assessing the students, by giving the assignments, by testing, and so on. Okay, so, so that is the first statement uh, given by Park in 2010, considering about the importance of giving assessment or doing the assessing activities. And now, the, uh, the statement given by Bart is also supported by the statement given by O'Malley and Pierce in 1996. Now we can see here, uh, it is stated that teachers spend as much as 20 to 30 percent of their professional time involved in assessment. Activities are brave to give the prediction about the proportion uh, that the teachers may have for being spent in terms of uh, doing the assessing activities for the students. It's about 20 to 30 percent. And I think it's not uh, 
a few, but it must be something a lot here, yeah? And once again, when uh, we want to conduct the assessing activities, it can be conducted in all stages of uh, teaching and learning activities conducted. So we can do at the beginning, we can do in the middle, or we can do in the final uh, position or at the end of the teaching activities conducted by the teachers. Okay, now concerning about the, the assessments that we can select and use for assessing the students uh, during the teaching and learning activities conducted by the teachers, of course, the assessment selected must be related to the goal of learning. In this case, the teachers are expected to understand about the goal or the objectives or learning or teaching English as the foreign language. Now we can see here uh, the, uh, the goal of learning English. Learning English is not only a matter of understanding or knowing what English is in terms of understanding the structure, but also of understanding about how the language can be used to communicate and build interactions. So in relation to the way how we can select and use the assessments that, we can be, uh, that can be given to the students, so we have to think that there must be the connection between the assessment that we can give to our students and the result of being assessed. It means that the assessments must lead the students to communicate and build the interactions. In other words, we can say that the assessment that, uh, uh, that can be used by the teacher for assessing the students must lead the students to communicate and build interactions as the depiction of the goal of learning English that, uh, that can be the target for learning here. Okay? But what can be the problems that are often commonly faced by the teachers uh, so far? We can see that many teachers tend to use non-performance tasks or assessments to assess the students' English learning progress, such as multiple choice or paper tasks. As we know that this kind of task doesn't lead the students to perform or to have the performances. So there is nothing to be performed. That's the performances that the students can do. So that's why here, what the, uh, what the students are learning, what the students have learned will never be performed if we just give the students with a multiple choice or paper-based test like that. So that's why here, I'm not talking about the teaching, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about the testing situation, but I'm talking about the teaching conditions. In this case, it is possible that referring to the good of learning, so we have to serve the students, uh, we have to give the best service to the students by giving uh, the opportunity for the students to perform something. Now, uh, it means that we just not give uh, the assessment in which the students just, uh, what is that, try to use their brain for thinking, uh, referring to the, as, uh, the the cognitive aspect, but we have to provide all the things needed concerning about the way how the students uh, can perform something uh, due to the assessment that we give to them. So that is the problem and the consideration that we have to take every time we want to conduct the teaching or even the assessing activities done by the teachers. Now, Concerning about the assessment, we do not forget to understand about the definition of the assessment. As we know that there are many definitions given by many experts here. And now uh, in this presentation, I just wanna perform you one of the definitions given by one of the experts, namely Brown. Because uh, you know that in my opinion, the definition of the assessment given by Brown is supposed to be the best definition. Because after reading and understanding about the definition given by Brown, I think I realized that I understand what is meant by the assessment is like about. So that's why now we can say, uh, we can see here, uh, it is stated that uh, the definition, the assessment includes all both incidental and intended activities done by the teachers to get the information about the students learning progress or development through having some performances in using the language. So referring to the definition given by Brown here, so there are some things that we have to take into the consideration every time we want to conduct the assessing activities to the students. The first is that um, assessment includes all both incidental or intended activities. It means that the assessing activities that we want to do or we want to give to our students can be done both incidentally or within intended activities. In other words, we can say there are two ways of conducting or giving assessments or conducting assessing activities for our students. The first is that we can give uh, the assessments or do the assessing activities incidentally. In this case, there is no plan before. It seems that when we assess the students, it happens naturally and directly because we don't have any plans for assessing the students. I can give you the example, the real example, what happens when the, uh, when the teachers try to give uh, 
the assessing activities incidentally. Supposing that what I have said before, considering about the way how we can give the explanation to our students. In explaining something or the materials that we teach to our students, sometimes we can ask the students. This can happen referring to the situations happening. For example, we can see that uh, during the explanation that we are doing, we can see the students are talking to each other and they do not pay attention to our explanation. So that's why we need to make the students have the focus again. So we have to make that uh, the students have the focus or concentration for understanding or paying attention to the explanation that we have, that we are giving. So that's why here, for giving back the focus, for getting back the focus, the student focus. So we need to give the questions to our students. When this happens, we realize that we don't have any plans for assessing the students, but it happens naturally, referring to the condition happening uh, during the explanations that we are conducting, okay? So that's why here, the assessing activities can be done by the teachers incidentally. And the other way of giving the assessment or conducting the assessing activities, we can do within intended activities. It means that we have the plans, we have the purpose, we have the goal. We realize that uh, giving the assessment or doing the assessing activities uh, are something important to be given to the student. So that's why here uh, we can plan for assessing the students uh, in, in the teaching and learning activities conducted. For example, this is also happen. Uh, uh, this is also possible to happen in the middle of the teaching and learning uh, activities conducted. Supposing that uh, the same uh, situation when we gave, we tried to give the explanations to our students, okay, and then we want to ask the students some questions. But the difference is that actually, when uh, we try to give the explanations to our students. Actually, we have the plans for giving the questions. So the questions that we want to give to our students can be prepared before or have been prepared before by the teachers. So that's why this condition indicates that we have the plan. We do the assessing activities within intended activities. So that's why here, that is the difference between giving the assessment or conducting the assessing activities incidentally and within the intended activities. And then, the second point that we need to take uh, into the consideration after understanding about the definition of the assessment given by Brown here, we know that the assessments given or selected or used by the teachers for assessing the students must be related uh, to the performance that the students may have. In this case, in other words, we can say that the assessments selected or used by the teachers must lead the, the students to perform something, to perform what they are learning and to perform what they have learned. And concerning about the performances, there are two types of performance that the students may do or may have. The first is called or known as the oral performances. In this case, the performances that the students can give through oral actions. For example, like uh, we can tell the student to speak English. So there are many activities, there are many tasks, there are many assessments that we can give uh, to our students. For example, like we, we tell the students to do the conversations, to do the presentation simulations, to give speeches, uh, to have the discussion, to debate, or to retell the story or something like that. So that's why here, the performances that the students may have is in the form of oral performances. That is the first type of performance that the students may give uh, when being assessed by the assessment, by the performance assessment, I mean. And then the second type of performance that can be uh, done by the students is written assessment, or I'm sorry, written performance. In this case, that is supposed to be the performance in which the students may have through the writing skill. So we specify in the writing skill here, when we want to produce the written performances done by the students. For example, we can tell our students to make an essay and to make the brochure or pamphlet. So that's why here, all the performances that can be done by the students are in the form of written things. So that's why here, there are two performances uh, that we can, uh, that the students may uh, produce, the oral performance and the written performances. Now, we talk about the contents of assessment. This is something important. We have to realize about the content of the assessment because every time we want to give the assessment, of course, we have to think, we have to know about the contents of the assessment that we have to give to our students. There are five things that we have to consider. Number one, 
This is about the students' progress and development. In this case, the contents of the assessments used by the teachers must facilitate the teachers, must give the access for the teachers to give the grades, scores, level, achievements, and outcomes. In this case, the teachers may recognize the students' progress and developments through the scores, for example. So when we talk about the scores, so this is actually like uh, the numerical symbols uh, given by the teachers for expressing about the students' progress and development. And then we can also make uh, the students, um, set the teachers to give uh, the grades, like the conversion using the alphabet to converse with, uh, to convert with uh, the numbers, yeah? For example, the students make an 80 and 80 is converted to be A, grade A, for example. And then levels, it also happens that we can level, we can uh, place the students according to the levels based on their competence. This often happens in the English courses. For example, like we know there is the beginning level, intermediate level, and advanced level. So that's why we can place the students based on the levels according to the assessment that we have given to them. Okay, and the outcomes, the outcomes is like the products. In this case, we can assess the students by producing any products. For example, like in writing, we can make the students to write down something, to write the essay. So the products that can be given by the students is the essay. So that's why here there exist the outcomes that we can give, uh, that uh, the students may give to uh, us when uh, we assess them. And then talking about the achievements, this is something different. For example, like we want to give uh, the training to the students who want to join the competition. So that's why here, uh, for example, like the debate competition, the students want to join the debate competition, and then we train them. And after that, after being trained, so the students may join uh, the competition, and then they get they win the competition. When winning the competition, so that exists the achievement that they will get here. So that's why here, the assessment, the contents of the assessments, first thing first that we have to pay attention or consider is having the facility, having the access for the teachers to give uh, the grade scores, levels, achievements, and the outcomes. The second thing, referring to the contents of the assessment that we need to consider is about the functions. In this case, there are five functions that we have to know. There are identification, placement, reclassification, progress monitoring, progress evaluation. Identification is something used uh, by the teachers uh, in the assessing activities where the, the teachers want to know the basic things. Uh, what happens basically to the students, for example, like university students in the first year. So we have to know the competence, the basic things, the first competence that the students have. So there exists the similarity, for example, considering what the average they have. And then the placement, this is something also important for making the students uh, to be placed in accordance with the level they have referring to the result of the assessment or the task given. And then progress monitoring, this can also happen when we want to uh, know the progress or development that the students have. And then the program evaluation, so it is also something important. One of the functions that, uh, that is concerned with the program health, uh, we need to evaluate whether the program that uh, has been given to the students uh, is successful or getting failed. And then the third thing, uh, the third point that we need to consider, uh, considering about the contents of the assessments, is about the feedbacks. In this case, the contents of the assessments that we can use for assessing the students must facilitate the teachers to give the feedbacks. As we know that, for example, we give the questions to our students. And in responding the questions, sometimes uh, we find that the students do not give the right answers. So when this happens, this is our job as the teachers to give the feedbacks in terms of making the corrections or even making the suggestions. And then number four, we are concerned with the principles. So the contents of the assessments used by the teachers may uh, touch the principles that has to be obeyed. For, uh, for example, like uh, this, is con this contains about like, criteria, transparency, consistency, standard, validity, and reliability. And the last thing, this is concerned with the manageability. It means that the assessment used by the teachers or given by, uh, given by the teachers to the students also need to think about the time allocation and the existence of the place. So if we find the assessment which is not uh, available to be used in ref uh, referring to the allocation of the time uh, that we have, so I think it's better for us to change the assessment, to find another assessment that is more appropriate to be used referring to the condition existing. And now, Another thing that 
is also important to be talked about here. Can think about the assessment is about the nature of the assessment. So this is like the characteristic that we have to understand. There are three things or three characteristics of the assessment that we can give to our students. The first is called assessments of learning. This type of assessment is used by the teachers or is given by the teachers after the teaching and learning activities are over. Concerning about the end of the program or the end of the teaching and learning activities done by the teachers, so we can say that it refers to what is that the procedure or the schedule that we have mixed well, what we have made and faced, or maybe we just talk about uh, something like the session that we have, for example, uh, we may concern with the chapter. Uh, supposing that we teach uh, the first chapter to our students, okay, and after uh, teaching the first chapter, before we continue understanding or learning about the uh, teaching the second chapter, so we need to assess the students, whether the students have understood or not about the first chapter that we have uh, taught them, okay, so that's why here this is called assessments of learning. Another example of the assessments of learning is like summative tests. You know what happens in the summative test. So the assessment is given at the end of the program, for example, in semester, in a period of time, okay? Now, we go to the second nature of assessment. This is called assessments for learning. This is quite different from what happens to the first one. Uh, this type of assessment is used or given by the teachers uh, when the teachers have the goal, have the intention for improving the student's competence. Supposing that the teachers uh, teach one material and then the teachers uh, recognize that uh, many students uh, do not understand about or the materials explained. So that's why here to get the improvement for the student's understanding and comprehension, we need to give the assessment for learning. For example, like quizzes, tax assignments, or maybe portfolio programs or projects. So those are concerned with the way how the teachers to improve the student's competence and understanding. And the last thing about the nature of assessment that can be thought about here is assessment as learning. This is something different. What happens to the assessment as learning is that it's not only the teacher wants to get the information about the student's understanding or comprehension, progress and development, but the, but the students have the potential have the chance or opportunity to recognize their own capacity, their own understanding, their own power in understanding about the language, for example. So one of, uh, one of the examples of this uh, type of assessment, assessment as learning, that we often use or give to the students is that self-assessment or peer assessment. Okay, and then now we talk about the kinds of assessments. There are many kinds of assessments that I want to uh, specify into three here. The first is known as the performance assessments. So this type of assessments leading the students to perform, to have the performances. So for example, like we want to tell the students to do the presentation, to do uh, the simulations, conversations, and many other things. Everything that uh, can be assessed uh, to the students will be related to the way how the students perform something, perform what they are learning, perform what they have learned. And then the second type of uh, assessment uh, is called portfolio. This is something different to what happens in the performance assessment. In portfolio, the most important thing is that there exists a process of completing the assessments. So this will not happen in a very short time, but there exists the process that we have uh, that the student must follow. For example, we want to tell the students to make the essay. So it's quite impossible for uh, students to complete the essay in a short time because there exist the steps, there exists the process that they have to do here. So that's why this is called portfolio. That is supposed to be, or that is concerned with the process and the kind of documentation. So there exist various documents that must be collected by the students for being assessed with the portfolio uh, projects. And then the last thing is like a peer or self-assessments. This is what I have said before, concerning about the nature of the assessment when talking about the assessment as learning. So by giving this assessment, the students have the potential, have the chance or opportunity to recognize their own capacity in understanding about English. And now we go to the second point for this discussion and this presentation. I want to talk about the task. There are many definitions given uh, by uh, the experts about the task, yeah? just what happens in the assessment. And now well, what I want to show you in this uh, slide, so this is the definition of the task given by Parchman and Palmer, 2010. We can see this. 
It is stated that tax is an activity that involves individuals in using language for the purpose of achieving a particular goal or outcome in a particular situation. So regarding this statement or the definition given by Parchman and Palmer, there are some things that we have to consider concerning about giving the tax to our students. The first is that we have to know the tax is an activity. It means that when we want to give the students the tax, it means that we tell the student to do some activities. Okay. And then the second thing uh, we need to consider is that the tax has particular goal, particular outcome. So in this case, we have to realize that every time we want to give the students away some tax, we have to make sure that the students, uh, I'm sorry, the tax may have the goals that must be reached by the students. And then there exists the outcome that can be produced by the students in a particular situation. For example, we can tell the students to make the conversation uh, by uh, applying certain concepts like greeting, apologizing, thanking, inviting, giving directions, and so on. So in this case, there exists a particular situation, there exists the outcome and the goal that must be read by the students by doing some activities given by the teachers or instructed by the teachers. And now, let's, uh, we are still talking about the uh, tax. One of uh, the things that we need to consider when we want to give the tax to our students is about the component that can be chosen by the teachers when selecting or using or giving the tax to the students. In this case, Robinson states that there are three components of the tax that has to be chosen, has to be thought by the teachers every time they want to give the tax to the students. The first is about the tax complexity. So this is uh, from the word complex. It, me it means that uh, the tax the type of the tax that ha that can be given to the students uh, is supposed to be something complex, which means that this tax needs the students to use uh, to think about the cognitive aspects that they have. For example, we can tell the students to write the sentences by applying the concept of grammar. So when making the sentences, when writing something, what uh, the students must do is thinking about the grammar, thinking about the, the patterns of grammar that can be used for writing the sentences. So this is complex. Not only write about the words by words, but the students have to think about the grammar concepts to be applied there. And then the second thing is about the tax condition. The tax condition is concerned with the, with the way how the students show their activeness and participation in doing the tax. For example, we tell the students to do the discussion. So we can realize, we can know that whether the students uh, have a good participation uh, in sharing ideas, in asking the question and the discussion, for example, and, and so on. And the last thing that we have to consider as the tax component that we have to choose is about the tax difficulty. The tax difficulty is concerned with the effective factors, for example, like motivation, confidence. So supposing that we tell the students to do the presentation in front of the class, sometimes we find that the students are not confident in doing the presentation. So that's why when we train the students to do the presentation, we actually have the, model, have the objective for making the students improving their confidence in presenting or doing the presentation in front of the class. So that is, uh, those are the components that have to be thought by the teachers every time they want to give the tax to the students. Now, after we understand about the assessment and the tax, now we try to make, uh, we try to get the relationships between the assessment and the tax. And I found, I'm sorry, I find there are five uh, things uh, that can be related together between the assessment and the tax. The first is that assessments cannot be made or given without having the tax. Yes, of course, this is true. Why? Because every time we want to assess the students, we have to make sure that uh, the assessment is like the tax. So there exists the tax, there exists the activities that the student must do that can be measured by us. And then the goal and target of assessing activities done by the teachers may depend on the kind of tax proposed. Yes, this is true. Every tax has their own uh, characteristics, resulting the outcomes, resulting uh, the productions or something that are different to each other. So that's why here, it depends on the kind of tax proposed. So the target or the goal of the assessing activities can be uh, entailed. And then number three, the tax of learning activities conducted by the teachers will be useless without being followed by the intention to assess the students. In this case, it is quite necessary for us if we want to assess the students, so we have the intention to make the scores to give the grades to the students. So the students will think that this is something serious to be done when we give uh, the scores. So we not only give the student the tax, but 
Okay, we will have to think about the grades, okay, the grading that we can give to them, okay, to make sure that the students will have good motivation for doing that. And then the uh, number four here, the types of learning activities may affect or enter the student's motivation through inserting the acts of assessing. So the tasks that chosen, uh, the tasks chosen by the teachers uh, must have a good uh, potential for making the students get highly motivated in doing that, in doing the tasks uh, themselves. And then the last one, both assessment and tax proposed need to consider the teaching strategies to be properly employed or given to the students. Okay. And now after realizing the relationship about the tax and the assessment, now we need to find one method of teaching that can be used uh, in relation to uh, the implementation of the application of the assessment and the tax. And that's, we can find tax-based assessment. What is that? Now we can see here. It is the teaching method leading the students to engage some of behavior which stimulates performances to be evaluated according to the real world criterion elements, including the processes, uh, uh, processes and outcomes and criterion levels. And then, uh, so we can see here that uh, when we want to implement the tax based assessments, so we have to make the students be connected. I mean, the tax that we give to our students must be connected to the real world criteria. For example, like the performance. So what performance do we have to make the students to do something like that? So it must be connected to the real world criteria. However, the tax based assessment does not simply utilize the real world tax as a means for eliciting particular components of the language to be measured or evaluated. In this case, even though we have the focus on uh, getting the real world criterion uh, for the tax uh, that we want to give to our students, but we have to think about the appropriateness of the, the tax that we give to our students with the teaching materials. So we not only try to focus on getting the real world things, but we have to make sure that the teaching, uh, there is connection between the teaching materials and the tax that we want to give to our students. And then now we go to the tax paid characteristics. Yeah, uh, this is given by Skihan, 1998. Okay, you can see here list of tax characteristics. Meaning is primary in the tax. What is meant by meaning? This is uh, talking about the performances. It means that when the students are assessed or are given the tax, and then the students may perform something, there exist the performances that the students may have. So the tax is supposed to be meaningful. And then. Tax includes a communication problem that must be solved. In this case, when we try to give the tax to our students, so we expect that there exists the potential for the students to solve the problems. So we not only give the tax or the activities for the students to do something, but we have to make sure that one of the benefits of the tax that can be given to the students is concerned with the way how the students can solve the problems. And then tax has some out of, uh, some sort of relationship to the reward. And I think this is, I have explained. And then tax completion has some priority. In this case, we have to make sure that every tax that we give to our students, we have to make sure that the students have the capacity to complete it. Okay, so that's why here the tax completion becomes the priority that must be reached when we want to implement the tax based assessment. And the last thing, the assessment of the tax is in terms of successful outcome. Okay, now this, uh, there, there are some suggestions for employing tax based assessment in your classrooms. Uh, you can uh, see this, for example, like number one, uh, the assessments or the tax based assessments uh, method or activities uh, given to the students must be based on the needs analysis, including students' input in terms of rating criteria, content, and context. Yes, before we want to give the tax, before we want to assess the students, so we need to analyze what is needed by the students. So in this case, uh, we can make sure that what we can, uh, what we can, what we can give to uh, our students in terms of the assessment and the tax are really important for the students because we have the we have the, we have ana analyzed the students' needs before, and then it must be as authentic as possible with the goal of measuring real world activities. And I think I have explained about this one. And then next, sometimes have collaborative elements that stimulate communicative interactions, and. As we know that referring to the good of teaching and learning activities, especially for the English classrooms, we have to make sure that the students use, uh, have the, 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 the potential for using English as a means of communication and interactions. So that's why the task must lead the student to perform through communicating and interacting. And then it must be contextualized and complex. 
integrate skills with content, be appropriate in terms of number, timing, and frequency of assessment. And the last one, it must be generally non-intrusive. In this case, along with the daily actions in the language classroom. Now, there are some benefits uh, that can be uh, given uh, if we will implement the taxpayer assessments in the EFA classrooms. Number one, it may encourage students to build critical, creative, and self-reflective thoughts, and then help teachers communicate to students about uh, the way how to help them get better achievements, help teachers and other educators better assess students' understanding of procedural knowledge, which is not uh, so easily judged through traditional assessment methods, especially what happens in the multiple choice tests. We can say that, for example, uh, the students may have high score in uh, conducting or in doing the multiple choice test, but talking about or concerning with the performances, concerning about their competence in applying or implementing or using the language, English, in the daily conversation, in the daily communication, we cannot make sure because what happens to the multiple choice test, there is nothing to be performed. There is nothing, the criteria, the parameter for making the students to perform something. That's why here uh, it's quite different from what happens to the tax-based assessment method here. And then it can also help teachers and other educators conduct a comprehensive evaluation of students' achievement, including students' strengths and weaknesses. And then it can measure students' abilities to accomplish real life language tasks. Okay, I'm sorry I can't explain in detail because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that I run out of the time, okay? So that's why I wanna go uh, fast here. So now, Concerning about the next point that I want to discuss in this presentation, this is concerned with the virtual learning activities. As we know that the tax-based learning or concept are useful if we want to conduct or we use, I'm sorry, we conduct the virtual learning activities. What happens in the virtual learning activities? So this is a learning experience that is enhanced through utilizing computers and all the internet both outside and inside the facilities of the education organization. So the teaching activities are carried out online whereby the teachers and learners are physically separated in terms of place, time, and both. So there are some considerations why we conduct the online and virtual learning activities. Number one is about the pandemic situation. So what has happened so far, we face the pandemic situation that most of the teachers, most of the school universities or institutions like to conduct the online learning uh, or virtual learning activities. Why? Because we have to avoid uh, besieging or mobbing and then uh, gathering together uh, with a huge number of the students in the class. And then the second thing, besides uh, considering about the pandemic situation, so we have to do the learning, uh, the online learning activities. So uh, there is another motivation why we have to do something like that. We have to do the, the online because this is concerned with what happens in the real world now. In, I'm sorry, in the real world now, okay? Uh, so this is, we need to support what is happening with the AE learning concepts due to the modern life, uh, free learning and technology development. And then now, what is supposed to be the flip learning? So actually, <coughs> the flip learning is not what happens in the blended learning. In this case, we have two uh, ways. Uh, in this case, we need to allocate the time. So we need to divide the time. Uh, the first is called asynchronous, and the second is called synchronous. So there are two allocations of the time that we have to give to our students. In the asynchronous learning activities, so this is uh, something outside uh, the class. It means that it can happen before and after the teaching and learning activities held. So that's why, for example, before we teach uh, something like the materials to our students, so we need to prepare the students. For example, we give uh, the students about some references to be read. So that's why when in the synchronous learning activity, when they have a dis uh, the discussion, the, the students may have a good preparation to join the discussion hard. So that's why here there are two concepts, asynchronous and synchronous learning activities or systems in the flipped learning model. And then some benefits of flipped learning model that can be uh, taken into the consideration. Uh, this, I'm sorry, these benefits are taken from uh, the previous researches that have been conducted by the previous researchers. For example, like uh, now, uh, for example, like number one, students have more flexible times to learn the materials. Uh, this is uh, from the research conducted by Cottrell and Robinson in 2003. And then the students get better comprehension and retention of the materials learned. Students gain the assistance in compensating the missing class. And the flip learning is also concerned with leading the teachers to promote the student-centered and active learning system. And flip learning encourages students to study at their own pace by taking responsibility for their own learning. 
And then the last one, deep learning not only have the students improve their oral skills in English, but also it enables them to be autonomous learners in order to have a deeper understanding of the course content. And now we go to the conclusion. So I have mentioned about the four things that uh, I have discussed here. Uh, they are assessment, tasks, and then uh, virtual learning activities and flip learning. Actually, these four things, once again, I say those four things have the connections to each other or connected to each other. Now we can see this one, assessment. As we know that assessing activities are something important that we have to consider during the teaching and learning activities conducted by the teachers. When we want to assess the students, we need the tasks. So we cannot assess the students without having the tasks. So that's why we have to find out the tasks, the, the appropriate tasks that can be used for uh, assessing the students. And then when concerning about the tasks, we know that it is quite necessary for us to think about the time allocation or the time provided uh, every time we want to conduct the teaching and learning activities. Supposing that uh, we don't have, uh, we, we have limited time, okay, allocation. So that's why we can use the flipped learning model in which it is possible for us to define the two concepts, the two ways of learning uh, containing about asynchronous and synchronous learning activity. I have mentioned by the one, okay? And then the last one. So when we conduct the flipped learning activity, I think this is actually the solution that we have if we wanna conduct the EFL virtual learning activities. So that's why here, those four things, uh, using the, what is that? The tax based assessment can be the solution for conducting the EFL virtual flipped learning activities. Well, guys, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's all for my presentations. I thank you for, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And okay, I would like to send back to the moderator. Thank you. Bye. Okay, wow. It, it's almost uh, complete from uh, Dr. Ahmed Heki Sujiat Moko from Indonesia. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I just would like yeah, to share the, the notes that I have uh, taken from the lecture of uh, Dr. Ahmad. Um, okay. Assessment is done all throughout the teaching and learning process, specifically in all stages. Then assessment must be related to the goal of learning. Third, we have to refrain giving assessment that focuses only on the cognitive aspect, but rather we have to give assessment that let the students perform something. Then we should have to have an assessment plan. Then assessment must be aligned to the objectives or goals. Also, the contents of assessment should be based on the following considerations. Number one, students' progress and development, function, feedbacks, principles, and the task activities. Also, uh, Dr. Ahmad discussed to us the nature of assessments, the kinds of assessments, and the tasks for students. And uh, moreover, Dr. Ahmad also discussed about the task-based assessment that involves leading the students to engage. And uh, some of the notes that uh, characterize the task-based based assessment are the following. Meaning is in the primary, primary in the task. Task includes a communication problem that must be solved. Task has... Um, must be in rela related to the real world and uh, some suggestions in employing the task-based um, assessment. And of course, the most the highlight for uh, Dr. Ahmad's talk is the, the flipped learning, which is very applicable during this uh, new normal setting of education. Okay, yeah. So it includes the uh, four, the assessments, the tasks, the flipped learning model and the EFL virtual activities. And that is uh, all about the task-based assessment. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for sharing okay, your expertise. Welcome, wow. Thank you so much. It, okay, welcome. Okay. it was <laughs> very extensive you. and complete. <laughs> thank okay. you so much. Okay, okay so 
Uh, Dr. Ahmad, please uh, stay with us. After this okay. activity, we will have the question and answer uh, okay. for coming from our participants. Okay, I'm ready for that. Okay, so to our participants, it's now the time for the quiz competition. So if you are, or we are inviting everyone to, co to please participate to our quiz competition. And uh, the winners for this quiz will have an e-certificate. Okay, the quiz competition link is posted on the comment section. So we will start our quiz competition after the presentation. And we have the quiz link. And um, if you have that application, the, the Slido application, you just have to encode the code IGP quiz, all cops. You can go to www.slido.com and then you use the code all cops igp quiz or you can just click the link in the comment box see currently we have 136 participants in our quiz competition winners for this competition will receive an e-certificate there will be 10 winners so we're still waiting for the questions that will will be flashed on the screen Again, you can go to www.slido.com and then use the code allcopsigpquiz or you can use the link in the comment box. Okay, let's start. The first question is, a global language is a language that is learned internationally, used by people who have no native language in common used by international organizations, all of the above. Okay, 86% of the participants got the correct answer. Let us now wait for the second question. We have... What advantages does CLT have over other approaches to second language teaching? Focus on real-time communication skills, focus on grammatical accuracy, focus on pronunciation and speaking, focus on the correct use of words and idioms. And 
let's check. Okay, we have 79% of the participants got the correct answer. Let us wait for the third. And number one on the list, Naung Lat Ton. For the third question, explanations during English language lessons should not be clear, concise, and graded to the learner's level. Check with the concept checking questions, scaffolded using visuals, long and detailed. And 61% of the participants got the correct answer. We have Melinda Hispano on the number one spot. Next, what are the factors affecting second language learning, aptitude, personal learning history, A and B? And 90% of the participants got the correct answer. On the letterboard, we have Maria Elena Beltran. Which country feels most threatened by the English language? Germany, France, Norway, Spain. And the answer is France, and that includes 21% of all the participants. And we have the next question, the concept of the English language as a global means of communication. People will change with the language and make it different, a mix of many other languages. The English language is a global means of communication language the immigrants used to speak and 87 percent of the participants got the correct answer again we have maria elena beltran on the first spot number seven how many countries use English as their official language? 120 sovereign states, 54 sovereign states, 67 sovereign states, 95 sovereign states. Wow. And the answer is... 54 sovereign states and only 13% of the participants got the correct answer. And we have Michelle de la, de la Cruz on the first spot. How many people speak English as their first language? 220 million, 330 million, 500 million, 430 million. You can just guess. Okay, the answer is 430 million and only 18% got the correct answer. Let's check who's on the number one spot. Okay, same person, Michelle De La Cruz. Seven out of seven. For the next question, how is task-based language teaching similar to EPP? Both focus on language and provide practice and communication opportunities. Both focus more on communication opportunities than language forms.
Okay, 88% of the participants got the correct answer. Next question, what is the current advice when it comes to teaching English to newly arrived tweens? Teach English in English, use the tweens L1 to teach them in them English, make use of all the tweens language skills from the start. And there are 51% of the participants got the correct answer. Let's see. Okay, so we have on the top five, on number one spot, we have Michelle De La Cruz, Ariel B. Mabanzag. On number two, number three, Edita Ballesteros. And uh, we're waiting for the list. Looks like okay. you don't have any lists. On the fourth, on the fourth, oh, okay, so we have the um, updated list of winners. On the number one spot, we have Raquel M. Manawis. Number two, we have Jassel Jane S. Cadavedo. Number three, we have Michelle T. De La Cruz. Number four, Ariel B. Mabansag. Number five, Damia Yusama. Number six, Glenny Ann Ramirez. Seven, Alvina Montalbo. Number eight, Lady A. Sugot. Number nine, Corazon Quintana. And number 10, we have Marjon M. Cadilena. And that's the top 10 winners for our quiz for today's webinar. And congratulations for the winners. You will receive an e-certificate from IGP. And for the non-winners, uh, we still have a lot of uh, webinars coming up so just stay with us just participate and maybe on the next round of competition you will all you will uh, also be our winners okay so for the, the next part of our event for tonight is the question and answer so i am inviting all the participants to uh have your questions or if you have any queries in your mind you can type it, your question in the live comment section you can mention first the name of the speaker to whom you are going to address your question so we have two speakers for tonight we have dr soria and we have dr ahmad both coming from indonesia Hello, Dr. Surya and Dr. Ahmed. Okay, hello. Okay, so we have our first question for tonight. To Dr. Ahmed, Heki Sujimoko, assessment over assessment or simply monitoring over assessment system that is in place? Who should be in charge of assessing the assessment system class-wide, institution-wide, or even nationwide? Is it effective to apply the principle of gradual release of responsibility to monitoring over assessment system? Okay, can I answer the questions? Yes, sir. It's okay, your... well, can I answer the questions? Okay, thank you very much for Ferris Barot for the questions given to me. Okay, well, I can say that uh, when talking about the monitoring, uh, or the assessing activities done by uh, institutions or the teachers. So it depends on the code that we have. 
In this case, for example, if uh, we think that the assessments given to the students uh, have uh, the goal for making the national quality of competency education to be improved, so of course, in this case, who will be in charge in giving the assessment is the national or the nations. But it can be uh, the university or the institution who can uh, be in charge of uh, uh, giving the assessing activities. So once again, it depends on the target that we want to give for our students. Yeah, that is uh, my answer. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for the question, uh, Ferus Akmarov. We have another question from Jave Tian. Question for Dr. Ahmed. Sir, how to do assessment for introvert students in online learning? Okay, thank you very much for Jave uh, Tian for the questions given to me. So you are asking about how to do assessment or giving the assessment for introvert students in the online learning. So I think uh, when, as we know that what happens to the interpreter, uh, interpreter students, so we need to make, uh, we need to give the assessment which are appropriate for them. So that's quite easy. For example, like uh, we tell the students to do something uh, considering about their characteristics. Yeah. So that's why it is possible for uh, keeping the assessments referring to the characteristic. For uh, the interpreter students, yeah, we, we, we know uh, many assessments that can be given. For example, like uh, considering about what happens to the students, like uh, giving the, uh, the students the tax with, uh, for example, like individual activities, for example, like uh, to make the essay. So that's why, because they are introvert, yeah? So that's why it is not necessary for the students uh, to work together because they are introverts. So that's why uh, we can give the tax like uh, to tell the students for uh, working individually. So that is uh, something that can be done by the teachers for introvert students, especially when uh, giving the assessing activities. Okay. So we have a lot of uh, personality of students. So thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Another okay. question is coming from Rose Bella Malo to speaker one. I think this is for Dr. Surya. What are some indicators that the learners had four C's? Are these, are these learners excel in English proficiency? To Dr. Surya. Hello, Mom. Uh, thank you for the okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think this method is a combination of two methods and and some activities. It is used as a method to make it simpler, simpler, but contains all aspects and can assess various aspects. It can also student to have. Uh, it can also train to have four C skills, uh, namely critical thinking, creative, communicate, and collaborative. Also, uh, we must uh, repeat, repeat, and repeat. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Another question is from Manolita Ramos Oligo, for Doctor Aman. What is the difference between? criterion reference assessment and the norm reference assessment in terms of uses and process. Okay, thank you for uh, the questions given, Monalita. Uh, what is meant by uh, criterion reference assessment? In this case, uh, there exists some, uh, what is that, the reference, uh, the norm of the reference that we have to take into the procedure for giving the assessment to the students. Yeah, And then ref uh, norm reference assessments I mean, the criterion, when there exists the criteria that we have to build up. For example, like uh, we want to give the students concerning about uh, like what happens in the introvert students. So there exists the criteria that we have to pay attention uh, to the assessment that we have to give or we can give to them. And then norm uh, reference assessments. Uh, of course, this is something like uh, the common things without any specific criteria to be given to the assessment. Uh, so that's why, because uh, this is for the common students here. And considering about the process, yeah, it depends on the situation, depends on the condition, what happens to the students. For example, like when uh, we want to assess the students who have the introvert characteristics. So the process can be done something like uh, we do not make the students to work together, but we can make the students to work something individually. And 
uh, th uh, considering about the uses, yes, I think it depends on uh, the condition of the students. Uh, when we consider the criteria, so there must be the criteria that we have to take into the consideration. And the norm, this is something in common without having specific criteria for uh, giving the assessments. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. I think it was uh, cleared already. Okay, from Michelle Aribado to Dr. Ahmed, what other ways to assess students, especially in modular learning? S cite some examples. Okay. Okay, you're, so you talk about the modular learning. So this is something like uh, specific. Yeah? So in this is from common to be specific things. For example, I want to give you the example. We want to assess the students about the writing skills. In this case, we want to tell the student to make the essay. So of course, there are some steps that we can give. For example, like we would like to, uh, what is that, uh, prioritize or what is that? Uh, we want to specify into some, some steps. For example, for the first time, we focus on uh, making the students understand how to write about the descriptive text uh, for the essay and then argumentative text for the essay. So there must be something specific yeah, that uh, we need to uh, create, we need to uh, reach in this case. So that is supposed to be the module learning systems. And the assessment, of course, we, we can do something like by uh, specifying the contents of the assessments or the instructions that we can give to our students. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for addressing that question yeah. because that that is very important in our uh, yeah. condition for today. Yeah. Okay. So we are waiting for the next question. Okay, another question from Manolita Ramos Oligo for Dr. Ahmed is role play task based learning. Okay. Yeah, it is possible to say that role play is a part of task based learning because the role play can be used as the task that we can give to our students. For example, when we want to measure about the students' progress and development in understanding about the, the, the speaking skill, for example, through uh, the role play, like uh, playing the drama. So it is possible for us to assess the students about the speaking skill by playing something like uh, playing the drama. So that's why, yes, I agree with you. I can say that the role play it can be categorized into one of the tax based assessments that we can give to our students. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Monalita. So you asked me again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another question is uh, from Teofilo Damoko. And this question is for Dr. Surya. Indonesia is among the models of the Philippines for mother tongue based multilingual education. How powerful is this approach to learning other languages? Thank you uh, for the question. I'll try to answer. This method was developed uh, to, facilitate, uh, to facilitate students in learning. Uh, the suggested methods are combined and can be more concise though, so that the response from student is good. Uh, I mean, uh, this, this, this method should have the students, I mean for, for uh, this, this approach can help the students uh, to learn the language uh, in Indonesian. Oh my God. Okay. So I think there's a problem, internet connection problem to Dr. Surya. Okay, so let us proceed to the next question coming from Gilbert Bulado. And this question is for Dr. Ahmad. Okay, uh, just taking the assessment or the results, it generates have direct value to the teachers. Yes, so all the assessing activities or all the assessments used by the teachers almost have the value for the teachers, for both the teachers and students. For example, like for the teachers, so it can make uh, 
uh, the teachers to analyze about the program, about the teaching strategies that they have, whether the strategies for teaching are successful or not. Suppose you get, for example, like if uh, in the assessing, and the assessment given, and then they found that uh, many students get failed. Of course, in this case, the teaching strategies done by the teachers get failed. So that's why the teachers must find another strategy that, uh, that is more appropriate to be used for teaching the students. And then for the students, of course, this is uh, so something important, and it takes the value. For example, like uh, the, the students may realize about their power to understand about something. For example, like uh, in the explanation given, so the students may not understand anything about what they are what they have been explained by the teachers so that's why there, there exists the problem they have what is happening what happens why don't they understand at all about the explanations given so that's why here when there is the questions given to the students so the students may realize what they need to do concerning about the way how to reach the understanding uh from the explanation or from the uh, learning activities done here uh, yeah that is uh, my answer thank you so much dr ahmed Another question is from Angeline Nanwal. Hello, Dr. Ahmed. How are you going to okay. convince those students who have less interest in learning via online class or blended learning? Thank you. Okay, Angeline Nanwal. Thank you very much for the questions given to me. Wow, this is something interesting because it often, uh, this is something commonly to happen when we face that the students who do not have a motivation for learning or for joining the blended learning or maybe the online uh, class learning. I think this can be, uh, the solution can be uh, taken from the assessment that we can give to them. So the assessment selected must be something interesting, something that can make uh, the students get interested in joining the program or joining the class. For example, uh, we can use the technology, okay, because we use uh, we, we are conducting the online learning activities. So we can facilitate or we can uh, utilize the technology in the teaching in the assessing activities that we are using. For example, we tell the students to record about uh, when and speaking English or making the conversation. We tell the student to record. And then we try them to, what is that, to in, input into the YouTube, for example. So this is something interesting because everybody wants to be the YouTuber. So we can give the potential for the students to be the YouTuber. And this is something interesting. And I'm, su I'm sure that uh, the motivation for the students may increase because uh, there is something else that can be reached by the students besides uh, by the teaching activities done. For example, like uh, the chance or the opportunities for them to be the YouTuber is something that is supposed to be the trainer days, okay? So that is the answer. So we can give the assessments which uh, can make the students get interested in joining the online learning, especially for using the technology. That is my answer, Angelina. Angelina. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Yes. And another question is from Gilbert Bulado. Question sure. for Dr. Ahmed. Sir, does ah. taking the assessment or the results it generates have direct value to teachers and learners i think i have answered this question before before actually yeah i have answered this question uh, the so, same the same question yeah, the same question okay. yeah considering what the so value i think i've done it uh, okay maybe we can proceed to the next question okay okay so uh I really appreciate our participants for giving questions for tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for the questions given to us. Okay, so. I think this uh, question had been flashed already uh, from uh, Gilbert. Bolano. Yeah. Yeah, I can make the conclusion about the question here. Okay, so okay. we have another question from Leonsha Sumikad to Dr. Ahmad. Sorry, Dr. Ahmad. <laughs> How well do multiple choice tests really evaluate students' understanding and achievement? Okay, thank you, Leon Sia Sumikat. Oh, I'm sorry when I uh, have the wrong pronunciation for your name, okay? Yeah, uh, considering about the multiple choice tests, uh, the question is uh, does the multiple choice test or do the multiple choice test really evaluate students' understanding? Yes, of course. Uh, this type of test uh, has the focus on making the students uh, think about the cognitive aspects. Uh, so this is concerned with the understanding. For example, what happens in the tuple test, okay? And in the grammar items. So the students need to think, uh, need to use their brain for thinking, for using uh, the cognitive aspect for uh, getting the right answers. So that's why the multiple tests are commonly used for the teachers if they want to 
test, they want to evaluate about the student's understanding, referring to the cognitive aspects. And then concerning about the achievements, yeah, I think uh, we can say that uh, the multiple choice tests have the achievements in terms of, for example, like the scores that the students may have, okay? For example, like we, we gave the students uh, like the, uh, the tests, and then we want to make sure that the students have the achievements, have the levels, for example. So that's why uh, it is possible that uh, we use the multiple choice, uh, multiple choice test uh, assessment. But concerning about the performance, I do apologize that I'm sure that the multiple uh, choice test uh, doesn't lead the students to have the performances. So this is the weakness uh, belonging to the uh, multiple choice test. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Okay. Let us wait for the next question. Okay. So we have a question from Angeli Nanwal, and this is for Dr. Surya. Is it necessary for the student or child to possess the four C's for them to be called as competitive? Uh, thank you for the uh, question, and Angel, Miss Angelina Nanua. I think it is uh, important uh, to practice to to, pra to practice uh, critical uh, thinking and uh, to uh, creative on uh, to collaboration on communicate. I, I think it's important. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Surya. Okay, we have another question from Dia Ruba Malavega. For Dr. Ahmed, what is the most effective assessment into two? It is assessment for learning or assessment of learning. Okay, so this is about the assessment for learning and assessment of learning. Okay, uh, the assessment for learning is used by the teachers for uh, um, testing about the students that uh, the students will get any improvement or not, okay? So the effective way here is that this is concerned with the way how to get the improvement for the students to, uh, through the assessment that we give to them. And then when this is the assessment of learning, so this is concerned with the, uh, with the end of the learning activities conducted by the teachers. In this case, what is supposed to be the effective one, it is not necessary for us to, uh, what is that, to give the test uh, for the students in the middle of uh, something. For example, like when we focus on giving the test uh, to the students uh, for the chapter one. So in the middle of the chapter one, it is not necessary for us to give the test. So we need to wait uh, uh, to give the test until everything is over. I mean, the teaching and learning activities are over in this case. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for that wonderful answer. Okay, let's wait for the next question. Okay, another question is for Dr. Ahmed. To improve students' abilities in all aspects during lecturing and to focus on the specific aspect respectively which way is expected to be more efficient okay uh, when we talk about the lecturing so this is something uh, different from what happens at school okay when the school uh, has the integrated system for learning english or for teaching english but what happens at university so this is considered the lecturing activities it means that there exists specific uh item or specific skill that we need to give to our students. So referring to the lecturing, of course, I agree and we try to give the specific thing. I mean, a specific assessment referring to the skill that we are teaching. For example, when we teach uh, the students about writing skills, so the assessments are concerned with the writing skill. And we want to teach uh, the speaking class, of course, the assessment given uh, will be related to the speaking skill. So that's why this is something different what happens between at university and at school. Okay, thank you so much for those wonderful answers coming from our speakers. And I think that was our last question for this uh, session. Okay, so.
before we proceed to any announcement, I would like to uh, say thank you to yeah. our to our speakers for tonight. Thank you, Dr. Surya and uh, Dr. Ahmed. Yo, I it thank you really, so much. Uh, it is really a uh, are pleasure coming, to be with you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for answering all the questions of our participants. For sure, they have learned a lot from tonight's <laughs> webinar. Uh, hopefully, that the answers given by me uh, can what is that, satisfy you, the questioners. Huh? Or we can talk yes. about it later if we have still have uh, other moments for uh, doing this conference. I'm going to train again. So this is yes, something amazing. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much. Okay. So to our participants and for more announcements, we have the triple bonus starting from October. We have webinar series program. You will get individual certificate for each webinar. And after submitting all certificates, you will receive a webinar cer series certificate. And uh, this is highly focused teaching strategies, research, assessment, pedagogy, tools, and techniques professional development communication skills and actually our session for tonight is part of the webinar series our first webinar series program the five parts webinar series topic is about authentic assessment in teaching and learning part one will be on october one that was yesterday part two was october four i uh, will be on october four part two will be on october seven part four on october 10 and part five on october 26 Our second webinar series program, a four parts webinar series. The topic is all about teaching English as a foreign language and assessment. Part one is, to, uh, this is the part, part one that uh, we have conducted. Part two is on October 6, part three on October 20, and part four will be on October 24. Our third webinar series program is also five parts webinar series. The topic is all about digital classroom engagement tools. Part one will be on October 11, part two on October 12, part three on October 13, part four will be on October 14, and part five will be on October 15. Okay, uh, presenting to you the certification process step by step. You can join our all live programs from Facebook page, Facebook group, YouTube channel, and the website. If anyone missed any program due to some unavoidable issues, still you can attend previous webinar with verified certificate. Step one is for the certification of process is uh, you can go to www.eduigp.com. And then you search the webinar on October 2. And the today's program name is Teaching English is a Foreign Language and Assessment, Part 1. Note that this webinar is part of the webinar series. This is just Part 1. There will be three coming. Step 2 is... You have to uh, click the certification link. The certification link is on the comment box. Okay, certification link, link now available in the comment box and pinned comment. Certification link will be available always in this program post in Facebook page, Facebook group, YouTube description. Certification process. You can claim your certificate in two ways. Number one is the direct link from comment box, pin comment, and post description. Or if you're not able to click this link, please directly browse www.eduigp.com for all information to, together. Find today's program, then process are the same. For step three, you can browse the www.eduigp.com or given link. You will re be redirected in this page of our website. If you are what if you are uh, using the YouTube, you can click the link 
and then click enroll now if you are new create your account if you have an account then log in directly after that find the seminar title and get enrolled okay the motivated part is code okay this is on the step four the code is igp2525 this is the code that you will be using to download your e-certificate. Always remember that without the code, no one is eligible for the certificate. So if you have your cell phone, you can take picture or you can take the screenshot. The code is IGP2525. The code is the requirement for you to download your certificate. Okay, so with code, click get your certificate. This is for the step five. And you have to use the code IGP2525. And for the step six, your certificate will appear like this on the screen. And uh, if you have noticed that on step seven, there is a certificate verification. That is the link that is a unique link for your certificate. So our free international webinar certificate is auto-downloadable in PDF file. You don't need to download it manually. So check your device file manager. Sometimes it looks uncompleted, which is for your mobile screen size. In PDF file, everything is perfect. Dear participants, if any problem raised to claim your certificate or any other issues, please don't be hesitate to contact us. Our core team members are always ready in comment section to support you to find solutions. And we have our team customer service representative on the FB page. We have Jaris Abejo, Kabiros, and Janet Kablau. For the team customer service representative FB group, we have Sherilyn Yamaguchi, Jonas Malingin, and Alonso Warren Cariaga. For the team customer service representative of YouTube channel, we have Calvin Linato, Joel Denoog, and Jeffrey Sayag. We have the upcoming webinar on October 3 on the morning session. The title is education we have speakers coming from the Philippines on October 3 evening session we have disaster preparedness and climate change adaptation we have also speakers coming from the Philippines on October 4 2021 we will have the part two of the webinar, webinar series entitled Authentic, Authentic Assessment in Teaching and Learning. That will be an evening session. On Tuesday evening, October 5, 2021, we will have a webinar in, entitled Competency Based Teaching. We have speakers from the Philippines and from India. On Wednesday, 21, we will have Teaching English as a Foreign Language and Assessment Part, which is the continuation of our webinar for tonight. The speakers from Tony also. 
on October 7, 2021, we have part of the webinar series entitled Authentic Assessment in Teaching and Learning. Speakers from Indonesia and from India. On October 8, that will be on Friday, Strategies in Competent-Based Curriculum. We have three speakers from the Philippines. And on October 9, evening session, we will have implications of theories of reading to the teaching of reading. We have a speaker from the Philippines, Mr. Jim Tar C. Desena. Another, another webinar on October 10, 2021, Bringing Character Education in Classroom. That is in the morning session. Speakers from the Philippines. And on October 10, 2021, evening session, we will have the part four of the authentic assessment in teaching and learning. We also have speakers from Indonesia. Another webinar will be on October 11, 2021, evening session. We have digital classroom manage engagement tools with Ed Puzzle. We have speaker from the Philippines. On October 12, 2021, evening session, Digital Classroom Engagement Tools with Kotobi. We have a speaker from the Philippines. Okay, so thank you so much to our guest speakers and to our pleasing viewers. Don't forget to collect your e-certificate from our website or by the link mentioned in the comment box. Before we end, let me acknowledge my warm identities who was so patient and attentive all throughout the session so after collecting the e-certificate don't forget to celebrate with igp but by checking in when by your checking in you can be able to understand our services your attachment and pleasure we hope to see you all again in the upcoming webinar we have a lot of webinars we have on October 17, we have another webinar, Becoming by Overcoming. And we have speakers from United States. On October 18, we have Personality Traits and Technology Acceptance. And we have speakers from Pakistan. Okay, in October 19, evening session, we have Subconscious Mind and Success. We have speakers from the Philippines and from India. Octo on October 20, 2021, teaching English as a foreign language and assessment. That will be part three of the webinar series. On October 24, 2021, we have 21st century teaching and learning, demystified. And we have first from Indonesia also. That's in the morning session. And on October 24, 2021 evening session will be the part four of teaching English as foreign language and assessment. We have speakers from Indonesia. Another webinar on October 25, 2021, the process to be a TVET trainer speaker from the philippines on october 26 2021 we have authentic assessment in teaching and learning part five that will be in an evening session and on october 27 2021 innovative ways to teach research in distance learning we have speakers from the Philippines. On October 28, 2021, evening session, we have international political economy and we have speaker from the Philippines. On October 29, 2021, we have work-life balance professionally. 
speaker from the Philippines. And on October 30, 2021, different teaching modality. And we have speakers from, two speakers from India. And on October 31, 2021, we have gamification, the future of distance learning. We have a speaker from the Philippines, Paul Martin de Vera. And on November 2, 2021, educational engagement with brain boosting. And we have a speaker from India. Now, on November 4, we have importance of students' motivation and e-learning. We have speakers from Malaysia. On November 6, we have transcending optimism in school management. We have a speaker from the Philippines. Upcoming webinar on November 10, 2021, Pedagogical Approaches in the New Normal. We have a speaker from the Philippines. And on November 14, Okay, so that's all for the upcoming webinars and uh, see you on the next webinar. And don't forget the code for tonight's event is IGP2525. The code is IGP2525. So before we end, let me have this short narration. Do not let this pandemic hinder your success to grow. Never allow it to stop you from achieving your dreams in life. Instead, let us look at the positive side and think of how we can be able to adjust and adapt with the changes brought by pandemic. Remember, it is through pandemic that we were not able to interact physically, but it is when we were able to learn how to use the learning platforms to connect and to communicate to great people in the whole world by having webinars like this for free. So there are many things to be thankful for. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, IGP. Stay safe and stay happy. Once again, from Auckland, Philippines, I am your host. I am Mr. Rian Jun P. Kualing, signing off.